Good morning, everyone. Cheviot Church, Cheviot Community, friends and family, everyone who is joining us from wherever you are this morning. It is so good to be with you. I'm Pastor Carrie, and I'm the pastor here at Chevy United Methodist. This is a church that is growing more and more in love with Jesus every day and learning how to serve him in the world. So if you're looking for a place to really find some meaning in your life and do wonderful things for the kingdom that we're going to talk about today, this is a great place to be. Hope you check us out at some point. Here's some things that are coming up this week. Uh, we are continuing uh, our uh, collection of needed items for Redbird Mission, clothing, small kitchen items, toys, blankets, sheets, towels. So sometime this morning uh, after church, you can go and, and clean, do some spring cleaning at home, bring those items back up until noon today, and we will take them and we'll be delivering a, a whole busload of goods uh, down to our friends at Redbird Mission. So we're hoping that you can participate in that. No furniture, please, just household goods. This is also the week that we are um, bringing sandwiches from our home and bringing them to the church. They will be donated to our daily bread. Um, the next sandwich drop-off date is Thursday, April 22nd from 8.30 to 9.30. And if you have any questions, um, you can contact Barb Scheibling or email the office at that email address on the screen. So it's getting to be that time of year, and I'm seeing little dandelions pop up. You probably are in your yard, and our landscape team has seen that as well. And so they are ready to get going, taking care of the grounds around this church. And this is a beautiful church with beautiful grounds. So if you're looking to join a really fun team that uh, loves to take care of the garden and the landscaped areas in our church, let Sue Duber know, and uh, I know she will gladly welcome you onto this team. And here is our friend Hannah, and she is extending the microphone out, and that is for you, anyone who is, uh, you know, oh, is okay standing in front of people and, and holding a microphone. We need people who do our prayer uh, on Sunday morning, who read scripture on Sunday morning, uh, and uh, we're looking for more people to do that. You can either be here to do it for a recorded service on Wednesday at 3.30, and or you can come Sunday mornings. If that's the only morning you're available, the only time you're available, we'd like you to be here at 9.40 a.m. You can contact me or Liz Arn, who is our scheduler for um, the readers that we need. And beginning next Sunday, I believe it is, May 2nd, we will start our 10 o'clock a.m. service, um, blended service here in the sanctuary. So set your clock, set your alarm uh, so that you uh, come at the new time, which is 10 o'clock a.m. <coughs> so Carol Gangwer, our music director, has chosen a very special hymn for this morning, and I'm going to let her tell you why she chose this. Good morning. I have chosen the hymn this morning, We Have a Story to Tell to the Nation, and our theme for the next several weeks is going to be on pursuing the kingdom life. And this song says so beautifully what we as Christians need to do to be uh, uh, kingdom keepers and uh, what our duty here on earth is to do. For you that are home, I want you to sing heartily along with this song. And for you that are here, would you please stand? And I'd like we're going to sing this in our hearts and in our minds through our, just quietly for our mask.
Good morning and welcome to week number one of Pursuing the Kingdom Life. Every Sunday, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray for God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. But do we really understand what we are praying for? Is Jesus telling us to wait until we die to experience the kingdom life? Or is there something more that he wants us to experience on this side of death? Is the kingdom life really possible in the here and now? If you have ever asked these questions, we are glad you are here today. For the next six weeks, we are going to learn what it means to pursue the kingdom life now while we are still very much alive and to allow Jesus' powerful Sermon on the Mount to enter our hearts and transform our lives. Let's begin. Please join me in the opening prayer. Holy God, we give thanks that you, have, that you often reveal yourself to, to be different from our expectations. Come Holy Spirit, and make yourself known to us today. Make your kingdom known among us so that we may show it to the world. Amen. You know, sometimes living the kingdom life can seem overwhelming to us, but really it's just as simple as making decisions day by day, hour by hour, to walk with Jesus and to allow him to guide our steps. This is I want Jesus to walk with me. Well, for many decades, we here in this church and in churches all over the world have prayed the Lord's Prayer. And that particular place where it says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the way that I like to say it, and we may change it up just a little bit, but listen to it this way. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, just as it is in heaven. That's what we're talking about. How do we bring the kingdom to bear on earth while we are here, and what part do we play? So this morning, as we begin our time of prayer, we're going to pray that our church would become a vital kingdom outpost, joining other churches in every corner of every little town across our country and the world, that the kingdom would come on earth through us. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving Lord, we read your word and it tells us that you came, you were sent with a purpose, and that was to bring the kingdom to earth. When you came and the people you spoke to, you said the kingdom of God is now here. And this morning, we bask in the kingdom that you have brought and we pray that it would grow. So our prayer this morning is that in every way, you would teach us, every generation that is represented in this church, how to be kingdom people in this day and time. How to walk with you, how to be a relevant church for all ages that we would teach and learn what the kingdom looks like and how we can be part of it. Our prayer, Lord, is as you continue to, by your spirit, enliven this church and bring us so many more opportunities to serve in mission, we bring before you this new and growing family ministry that you have placed on our hearts we bring before you the ways that we have reached out to the poor in our community and the growing relationship with Scarlet Oaks. Lord, you are doing a wonderful thing through us. We pray that you would strengthen us, that you would bless us, that you would show your favor upon us as we represent your kingdom. We pray that you would Heal us in every way, body, mind, spirit, soul. We pray that you would heal our family members, those that we are thinking about this morning, and bring solutions to problems that we can't yet see. In all these ways, prepare us to be your kingdom dwellers and to show the world what it looks like to follow you. And now as your disciples, whom you taught to pray this prayer, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're privileged as a church, as I continue to say each week, to be able to serve through our generosity. And you continue to do that. Our giving, as our finance team met this past week, is very strong, has been very strong through this pandemic, and because of that, we can continue to dream about a very strong future and the mission that is in front of us. So I thank you in advance for your giving today. Please join in the offering prayer. Generous God, you put love into human form in Jesus who lived, died, and was raised to eternal life. Receive now these offerings that your grace may abound through our lives as we grow as kingdom people called to transform the world. 
Today's scripture reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 3 to 10, and chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are, are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure of heart, for the, they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are per persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Well, I'm very glad that you're here and joining us for this very first Sunday of a new series called Pursuing Kingdom Life. I want you to imagine for a moment that you were taking a look at our Facebook page or our website earlier this week, and you saw a post that said, Jesus Christ will be preaching at Cheviot United Methodist Church this Sunday at 9, 10 a.m. All are welcome. Please come early, as seating may be limited. What would you do? Would you set your alarm, get your kids and your grandkids up? Would you get here extra early? This is what Jesus' early followers experienced one morning in Jerusalem when word got out that Jesus had gathered some people for a sermon. But it wasn't church inside with people sitting in pews. No, it was outside on a hillside, overlooking the Sea of Galilee, the breeze blowing his robes, the grass swaying in the wind, and the sun shining on their faces. And after everyone was seated, he stood up in the midst of of the crowd, and he said these four words, blessed are those who, and he had them, all of their attention, all of their focus, riveted on his next words. You might say that he had them at the word blessed. We want to be blessed, Jesus. What will it take for me to be blessed? Show us the way to a blessed life. And then he would begin his most famous and most repeated sermon that has come to be known as the Sermon on the Mount. It was a brilliant way to open a message. And the word blessed was the hook. What they were about to learn is that the kingdom of God had come in Jesus Christ and they needed to pay attention because everything was about to change for them. This was not a sermon that you wanted to sleep through or look at your phone or let your mind wander. This was not a sermon that People would go out to lunch after and then forget what the sermon was all about an hour later. You know, what I'm, you know what I'm saying. This was a sermon that would need to be deeply understood, read often, studied, and wrestled with. This was a sermon that would be dissected and discussed and commented on and written about for thousands of years after it was spoken on that grassy hill. 
because it defined a new way of life that had come into the world with Jesus and would be the defining way of life beginning with him into eternity for all who would choose to follow him. But why this sermon? Why these people? And why now? Another powerful word he used was the word kingdom. Kingdom. It's not a word that we use very often today. We don't live anymore in a world of kings and queens and lords and ladies. And yet Jesus used the word kingdom often because his followers would have been familiar with what it meant that a new king was on the throne. There was going to be a new way of life ushered into the world, and it was going to turn the world as they knew it upside down. They would understand, perhaps better than even we can understand today, what it meant that a new king had taken over. Throughout Israel's history, there had been a multitude of different kings, and based on the character of that king, the people in that kingdom would either be blessed or cursed because of who he was. There seemed to be no middle ground in the world of ancient Jewish kings. Either the king would do what was right in the sight of the Lord, or he would not follow the ways of the Lord. And depending on which king was on the throne, life for the people would either flourish or decline. Kingship was a very big deal and carried strong implications for their well-being as a nation and as individuals. The kingdom life that Jesus was bringing would be good news for people who had not had a lot of good news in their life. Jesus had spoken about it just days before when he stood up in the middle of the church and recited Isaiah. He said it was going to be good news for the poor, good news for the oppressed, good news for the prisoner, good news for those who were sick, those who were cast out of the temple. But it was not going to be good news for the religious establishment of the day, those who wanted the blessing only for themselves and who believed that God's blessing was only reserved for them. Their life was going to be turned upside down too. The timing of this sermon is important as well. Jesus delivers this sermon very early in his ministry. Prior to this particular day, he had come from his baptism in the Jordan River, From there, as you remember, the Spirit compelled him into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. He came out of that experience not giving in to the devil's temptations, and then he does two things. He begins to gather his followers, the fishermen that he told to follow him, and he begins to teach them about the kingdom of God. So what Jesus is doing in this message is that he is laying out what the kingdom of God is going to look like for them, and then he goes out into the street and begins showing them what the kingdom of God is going to look like. He begins to heal people that shouldn't be healed, to eat with people he shouldn't be eating with, to forgive people who shouldn't be forgiven and doing it all as he is 100% obedient to his Father in heaven. It's like he is unrolling an ancient blueprint, one that had been drawn up since before the beginning of time until just the right time. 
He lays it out, and then he begins building the structure that will inhabit the kingdom. Why did he do that? Just to let people watch him and comment on how loving and forgiving that he was? No, there was more. He did that because he wanted them to continue building the kingdom after he left them and went back to the Father. They would continue on with the construction project for the kingdom of God, and we today are still in that construction project today. You might say that every church, on every corner, in every town, and every city is a kingdom-building outpost. What does it look like today to live in the kingdom of God, to grow the kingdom of God? That's what we're going to be talking about for the next five weeks. We're going to go back to the sermon and make sure we understand each part of the sermon. But I had an experience earlier this week that showed me what the kingdom looked like, and I want to share it with you. It was 2 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. I was traveling north on Route 75, getting ready to exit at Route 63. If you've been to Route 63, you know why some people call it Dysfunction Junction. It is a mass of lanes of traffic going multiple different directions. I was remembering as I pulled off the exit a conversation that I had had with a friend earlier that week because she had been in an accident at that very same exit. And as I'm thinking about her accident, I put my left turn signal on, I make a, a, a move into the lane next to me, and bang, hit that car that was in my blind spot that I never saw. Oh, you know what it feels like right after a fender bender like that. I pulled over to the side, somehow got through the six lanes of traffic, and the car that I hit went ahead of me about 100 yards and did the same thing. And for just a couple of minutes, we both sat there without getting out of the car. Then I finally did get out of my car, and this is what I saw. And I knew her car couldn't have looked much better than mine. At some point, we both exited our vehicles and we started walking toward each other. That was after I made a call to the police to say that there had been an accident. And let me just say at this point that I knew I was 100% at fault at this point. I didn't know what to expect from that other driver. You never know, do you? We were so far apart that I couldn't see her face, but as we began to get closer to one another, I did see her face. And she was smiling. I had just banged into the side of her car, and she is smiling? She got closer to me. She looked at me with very kind eyes, and she asked me a very strange question. She said, are you a Christian? Well, yes, I said, but why do you ask? Well, she said, I am too, and I, because we're both Christians, I was just going to suggest that you take care of your damage, and I'll take care of my damage, and we'll just go on our way. But, but I'm at fault, I said. Oh, yeah, I know, but it's okay. I'm not going to make you or your insurance company pay for the damage to my car. Is that all right with you? I said, what is your name? And she told me. And I said, thank you so much. And with that smile still on her face, she turned and walked with a little spring in her step back to her damaged vehicle. The police did eventually come. We filled out all the proper forms, took the proper pictures, and they issued me, of course, my proper ticket, being at fault for the accident. 
but something had happened to me in that process. I thought about how grateful I was that I had hit this particular kingdom dweller in the middle of six lanes of traffic. But then I wondered something else. If that had been me who had been hit, if I had been the innocent victim of someone else's mistake, would I have represented the kingdom in the same way? This was the kind of kingdom that my friend on the highway knew a lot about. And she believed in it so much that she allowed this kingdom way of life to infiltrate a car accident in the middle of the day in 2021 in the here and now. Why would anyone do that? Why would anyone want to follow the kingdom life at all? Well, Jesus tells us in his sermon, and it was the first word that he used that hooked his congregation, it was the word blessed. What does it mean to be blessed? These are our sermon notes today. What was Jesus talking about when he said, blessed are those who... Well, first of all, blessed means to be happy. We don't think we're going to be happier if we forgive someone's reckless driving. But she was. The smile never left her face. Number two, blessed means to receive God's favor. Why is that? Because we're living according to the king. We are following the king's direction. We're living in his realm, in his dominion, and he is showering his favor upon us as we do that. And third, blessed means to be approved by God, to, be, to, to know that he is smiling at us as we live according to his kingdom. Happy, in God's favor, and approved. Could there be any better reason to live a kingdom life? But there was going to be more surprising things and things that would cause you to scratch your head as you continued to listen to Jesus that day. Because what he would describe to us doesn't look like blessed. He said, here are the characteristics of people who will be blessed in the kingdom. Number one, we would have poverty of spirit. What does that mean? We're going to talk about that next week. Then it says, blessed are those who mourn. How can it be a good thing to mourn or to grieve? Blessed are those who are meek. Meekness and weakness are not the same thing. We're going to discover that as we go through together. Blessedness comes from being hungry for righteousness. The Bible says righteousness. It's the same as right living. Instead of trying to make excuses for my wrong living, The Bible says, Jesus said, you are going to be happy if you hunger for right living. Imagine that. Happiness comes from hunger. People are blessed when they are merciful. People are blessed when they are pure in heart. When they are peacemakers, like my friend on the highway. And when they are persecuted for following a way that is different from the world. All of these things are the measure of kingdom dwellers. This was not going to be a temporary kingdom, Jesus said, but an eternal kingdom. God was now going to rule over the world, and his way of life 
would be the way of the world eventually as more and more people were growing as kingdom dwellers until Jesus returns and the entire thing is going to be under his reign. It's almost like that day on the hill. Jesus drew a line and he made it very simple for his listeners. He said, on one side of the line is the kingdom of this world with all of its pain and anguish and hatred and division and guilt and condemnation. And on the other side is the kingdom of God where people can be happy, find favor, and be approved as they follow Jesus. And he's saying to his, to his congregation that morning the same thing that he is saying to us as a church today in 2021. He's just saying, choose your side. Which side do you choose to live on, to live in? That's what we are going to be exploring and learning as we move forward in the next six weeks. And I hope you're here each week as we draw closer to the kingdom. Let's pray. Lord, because you came, because you died, because you rose again, we can live in the kingdom no matter where we live today and what address we have, what kind of house we live in, what kind of car we drive, your kingdom is always available to us. Help us, Lord, this week and every week. Remember that we walk with you and that each choice we make makes a difference for the kingdom. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Every day they pass me by I can see it in their eyes Empty people filled with care Headed who knows where On they go
all the grief they bear. They must hear the words of life. Only we can change. People need the Lord. People need. We are a kingdom outpost in this place, in Cheviot, Ohio, and we are called to bring the kingdom to our community. It's one of the main reasons we exist as a church, and each week we remind ourselves why we exist as a church. This is our vision, and we invite you to, to, to read it along with us. Our vision is to connect and serve all people so that lives are transformed and empowered through the love of Christ. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and to show favor to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and bring you peace today and every day as you live in his kingdom. Until we meet again, see you then.